Hello, David Diga Hernandez here. You are watching Encounter TV. On today's program, I have with me a very special guest who had an experience that's unlike anything I have ever heard. You're not going to want to miss today. With me today on the program is my brother, Bill Weiss, is here with us today. And, uh, and so we're so excited about having you. And you know, you had an experience that's unlike anything I've ever heard. And I want you to take us back to just that night that you first experienced this. And, and I know it was one experience. Just take us to that night and tell me, what was it a regular day? It was. First of all, thank you, David, for having me. It's an honor to be on your show. But yes, we were a uh, regular, normal day, nothing unusual about the day. We attended a prayer meeting that we attended every Sunday night at our friends, Pastor Raul and Sharon's house, and came home, nothing unusual about the night. I've never studied the topic of hell. I've never gone to dark movies or taken drugs, none of that. I've never had a vision before. But uh, so what this was, was uh, an out-of-body experience that would be classified as a vision in the Bible. In 2 Corinthians 12, 1 and 2, Paul, when he was caught up into heaven in a vision, he said, whether in the body or out of the body, he didn't know. Well, the Lord showed me that I left my body. Now, I've never had a vision or anything like this, but I had gotten up at three o'clock in the morning to get a glass of water. And suddenly I was pulled out of my body, like being drawn out of your body. And I found myself falling through the air down this long tunnel. And it was getting hotter and hotter. And I entered into this open cavern area and I landed on an actual stone floor in a prison cell in hell. I had no idea how I got there, why I was there. Nothing was explained until the way back. I was fully awake and cognizant, David, uh, just like I'm standing here now, and, uh, but in this prison cell. Now, just to explain a couple things so people understand, in a vision in the Bible, you can travel, just like Paul and John did to heaven. They were taken to heaven in a vision. Ezekiel was picked up by his hair and he was carried to Jerusalem in a vision. He was told to eat. He experienced the sweetness of the food in his stomach. He wept, he conversed. My point is, in a vision, you can experience the same things in your spirit body that you would in your physical body. It's just as real. Wow. So in a vision, you can travel in your spirit body. First Corinthians 15, 44 talks about a natural body and a spirit body. So that's what this was. So just so people can understand, because I've been a Christian for 43 years, this happened 14 years ago. So only in a vision can a Christian see hell. And that's what this was. So I traveled. I just want to make that point clear. Okay. Um, and the, Job 7.14 says, You scare me with dreams and terrify me through visions. So you can't have a terrifying vision. Isaiah 21.2, he was given a grievous vision. And in Job 4.14, Eliphaz was given a vision that caused his bones to shake. So you can't have a grievous, terrifying, bone-shaking vision. As a believer. Yes. Right. And uh, the purpose for me seeing this place was to point people to the scriptures. It's not important for anybody to believe my experience. I'm not here to convince anyone to believe my experience. I'm just here as a signpost to point them to the scriptures and by those be persuaded because there really is a hell just like the Bible talks about. Jesus talked about hell, 46 different verses he mentioned it and uh, because it's a warning. He doesn't want anybody to go to this horrible place. You mentioned that you were perfectly cognitive. Right. And uh, some people, when they hear that, they have a little trouble understanding because everyone thinks of the spirit realm as just this fuzzy, mystical kind of pseudo experience right. that's not real. But you're, you're telling me, just as you, you, you know this is real right now, yes. you were that cognitive. Absolutely. You know, just like John when he went to heaven, he described what he saw in heaven. And it's, it's very, very clear. I mean, he was actually there in heaven. This is not to compare my experience with any of the great men of the Bible, but just to give a scriptural basis. So I was fully awake, just like I'm, I'm sitting here now. Wow. And I, I couldn't believe I was there. Why am I here? Nothing, I didn't understand why. But I'm telling you, David, hell, if anybody could see hell for five seconds, it would change their whole life. It is the most horrifying place your mind came and imagine, but I first found myself in this prison cell. Uh, I'm just going to give a few scriptures along the way so people can understand, Absolutely. you know, because yeah. everything I saw is already in the Bible. I, I wrote books, and in the books I have over 250 verses that talk about everything I saw is already in the Bible. But Isaiah 24, 22 says, And they shall be gathered together as prisoners are gathered in the pit and shall be shut up in the prison. Proverbs 7, 27 mentions going down to hell to the chambers of death. The word chambers means inner rooms. Job 17, 16 says they shall go down to the bars of the pit. Jonah 2, 6, the earth with her bars was about me forever. So the point is I, I was in a prison cell with bars and rough-hewn stone walls, and it was literal. 
Uh, it wasn't metaphorical, it was the real literal bars. And most of the commentaries agree that, it, that Jonah, in Jonah 2.2, he was actually in hell, and it was literal bars and grates. So that's where I found myself. And like I said, the heat was so far beyond the ability to sustain life. I wondered how could I be alive in this heat? Mm. I should be dead. I was lying on the floor in the cell, and uh, I, I had absolutely no strength in my body. I thought, what's wrong with my body? Why, why is it so much effort to try to move? But Isaiah 14, 9 and 10 says, Hell from beneath is moved to meet thee at thy coming. They will say, Art thou become weak as we? And Psalms 88, 4 says, I am counted with them that go down into the pit. I am as a man that has no strength. Now, so one of the things you have to endure in hell for all eternity is you're completely void of any kind of physical strength. And so you're defenseless. You, you can't hardly move. But see, even Acts 17, 28 says, In him... Jesus, we live and move and have our being. Wow. So even movement comes from God. It's not automatic. So you're void of all this. It's like if you ever had the flu and you felt weak. Yeah. What's well, a thousand times worse? You can't hardly move. Anyway, I looked up and I saw these two enormous beasts. They were demons. And they were pacing in the cell like a vicious, caged animal. The most ferocious demeanor. Uh, they were bumps and scales all over the one's body. Huge jaw, sunken in eyes, claws about a foot long. And uh, these particular two were about 12 or 13 feet tall. And that's not an exaggeration, but there's even scripture I could give you for that, but I'll keep moving. And they were pacing like a caged animal and they were blaspheming and cursing God. They had an extreme hatred for God. But we know blasphemy comes from the demonic realm. Revelation 13, 6, James 2, 7, and some others. And then they directed that hatred they have for God, they directed towards me. I wonder why, what have I done to them? But the one picked me up, threw me into the wall of the cell. Wow. Tremendous strength, demons have. I hit the wall, bones broke, I collapsed on the floor. You felt your bones breaking. I felt breaking. bones break, but I understood that I was only feeling a small amount of the pain. I didn't understand that, but on the way back, the Lord explained that he did allow me to feel a small amount of the pain, but he blocked most of it uh, because he wanted me to ex experience some so I could relate to people that it's not a state of the mind, it's real literal pain you're gonna feel in hell. But as this is going on, in your mind, aren't you thinking, Lord, help me? No, because see, I was there as an unsaved person. Now, I have to explain this part. God blocked it from my mind that I was a Christian. He hid that fact from me. And, and then you might say, where's that in the Bible? Luke 24, 16, Jesus, when he appeared to the disciples on the road to Emmaus, it says their eyes were holden that they should not know him. Well, John MacArthur's commentary and Matthew Henry's and many others say that uh, they were kept by God from recognizing him. God hid it from their minds. Many examples of this are in the Bible. Well, God hid it from my mind for a reason. He wanted me to experience what they feel there, hopelessness. Wow. You see, as a Christian, I would have said, praise God, he's getting me out of here. I would have known that, right? But as an unsaved person, that's what he wanted me to feel, the hopelessness. You see, in hell, they, those people know they're never going to get out. A hundred million years ago, by they know they're not getting out. Isaiah 38, 18 says, those who go down to the pit cannot hope for thy truth. And we know Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He's the truth, but it's too late for them. That's what he wanted me to feel, that hopelessness. So these creatures were directing their hatred toward you. Right. And then the other one picked, his, picked me up, dug his claws to my chest, just tore the flesh open. Now that should have killed me. I thought, why am I still alive through this? I should be dead. But you can't die. See, death does not mean cease to exist. It means separation from God. Hmm. Spiritual death is separation from God. So you still exist in this body. I noticed I had a body. Matthew 10, 28 says, Fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Remember Luke 16, the rich man, he lifted up his eyes. He wanted a drop of water to cool his tongue. He had eyes, he had a tongue. So you, you have a body, but it withstands these torments. And I, but I noticed there was no blood or water coming from the wounds. You know, normally you see blood, but there was no blood or water. But Leviticus 17, 11 says the life of the flesh is in the blood. Hmm. Well, there's no life in hell, so there's no blood. And Zechariah 9, 11 says thy prisoners out of the pit where there is no water. There's not one drop of water in hell. And David, these creatures have no mercy over you. These demons hate you. But we know Psalms 103, 17 says the mercy of the Lord is upon those that fear him. Well, they don't fear him in hell, so you don't derive the benefit of mercy. And um, about this time, it went dark. Now, I believed it was God's presence there to illuminate it so I could see, to describe to people what it looks like. But then it resumed its normal state, absolute pitch black darkness. But we know Lamentations 3, 6 says, He has set me in dark places as they that be dead of old. Or Jude 13 mentions blackness of darkness forever. But it wasn't just dark. You could literally feel the darkness. And, and that's not an exaggeration. Exodus 10, 21 mentions a darkness that may be felt.
What do you mean you could feel it? Well, it, it's so it's so evil that and so dark it just penetrates through every cell in your body. It's wow. not just dark like here. You couldn't see the hand in front of your face, and, and the whole place is filled with evil, and and you just feel it. It's like Exodus ten twenty one mentions. I was taken out of the cell. I was placed over next to this large raging pit of fire. Now it was God that took me out, but I didn't realize that then. I was just placed over next to this pit. And this pit, I understood, was about a mile across with real literal flames raging high up into this open cavern. And David, this is where I could first see people. There were thousands of people inside this pit burning, on fire. And that's the most awful thing is to see a person on fire burning. Most of us have never seen that but there are thousands of people screaming and the screams are so loud you want to get away from the screams you know if you've ever heard a person scream well there's thousands but you can't for all eternity you have to endure that you know but Isaiah 57 21 says there is no peace saith my God to the wicked and Isaiah 32 18 says my people dwell in a quiet resting place we're well, not his people so you don't derive that benefit of even quiet wow. and uh, but to see people on fire and there were demons shoving people back into this pit uh, the, and, you know, but more importantly, you know, the real fire, Jesus talked about fire. In 18 of those verses he talked about hell, he mentioned about the fires of hell. So again, it's not metaphorical, it's not a state of the mind, it's real literal fire. I felt the heat, I saw the flames, but it's more important what the scripture says. Psalms 11, 6 says, upon the wicked he will rain fire and brimstone in a horrible tempest. Uh, Matthew 13, 49 says, The angels shall sever the wicked from the just and cast the wicked into a furnace of fire. Many scriptures that talk about real fire, I could go on and on, but, but the point is, we know what fire's like. You said you saw yeah. people and you heard them screaming. Was there ever a point where you conversed with anybody? No. Those people are they're in a pit. They're all kept isolated and apart from each other. They don't know, they're not aware of each other? Yeah, they could see them, but they're far apart, so you could have no conversation. So you never get to converse with anybody again in hell. You're completely isolated by yourself. And that's an awful thing to, to experience. No conversation ever again. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's people in individual pits of fire also. There's a lot of people in the big pit, but there were individual pits of fire that I saw. But that nobody is together. You have no purpose, no destiny. It's a complete useless wasting away. But Ecclesiastes 9.10 says, There is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in Sheol. Sheol is the Hebrew word for the current hell. And so it's, you have, it's just a waste. And it doesn't matter if you're somebody famous here. No one would know who you are there. You have no identity. Ecclesiastes 6.4 says your name's covered in darkness. No one would know who you are. And you're completely forgotten in hell. Psalms 88.12, Isaiah 26.14, many scriptures. It's an awful thing to just be forgotten. You understand nobody up on the earth has even given you a thought. Hmm. Nobody remembers you or, or thinking about that you still exist down here. I thought about my wife. I thought about her up on the earth, and I understood I'll never get to say goodbye to her. She'll never know that I'm here. And that's an awful thought to live with for all eternity. That you can never say goodbye to your loved ones. They'll never know that you're down here suffering, still existing. Wow. Job 7.9 says, He that goes down to Sheol shall come up no more. You understand you're not getting out. And um, the stench in hell is so foul and putrid, the worst odors you can ever imagine worse than any open sewer, bad eggs, rotten milk, everything you can think of times a thousand. And remember Jesus rebuked the foul spirits, Mark 9, 25. Yes. The demons have a foul smell, the burning flesh, but also you're breathing in uh, burning sulfur, which is toxic. If you go to Hawaii to the volcano, you know, they have signs posted where you cannot go past a certain point because the toxicity of the burning sulfur coming up, it will kill you, it's sulfur dioxide. If you breathe that, it will kill you, it's toxic. Well, sulfur is just another word for brimstone. And there were brimstones all through the Bible. So you're breathing in this foul, putrid air that should kill you. And so you don't want to breathe. But it's even worse than that because there's not enough air to breathe. And you have to fight and gasp for even the tiniest bit of air. And, but maybe only an asthma patient can relate to this. But this is how you breathe in hell. It was like... Uh, uh, uh. That was as much air as you could get. Well, that's not enough. You feel like you're going to die any moment. But see, Isaiah 42, 5 says, the Lord gives breath to the people upon the earth. You're not upon the earth, you're down deep beneath the earth. God's real specific with his word. And you need, you need to sleep in hell, just like here we need sleep. Now, I was only there 23 minutes, but I felt like I was there 23 weeks. Wow. And you need sleep, just like here. You know, if you stay up for one or two nights, you know, you ever stay up for two nights with no sleep? Yes. You're pretty much a wreck after two nights, right? You can't function. Well, hell, it gets progressively worse, and you need to sleep. 
See, Revelation 14, 11 says, and the smoke of their torment ascends up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night. Now, no rest from the torment, but no rest of any kind. Because Isaiah 57, 20 said, the wicked are like the troubled sea that cannot rest. You know, the sea's always moving. But see, rest is a blessing from God again. Psalms 127, 2 said, the Lord gives his beloved sleep. You're not his beloved there. So there's no rest. There's no water. There's, there's no, no breath, water. There's no communication. No communication. Um, you don't get to eat. You have the feeling of hunger for all eternity. You don't get, you know, if I was to give you a drop of water, that wouldn't suffice, would it? You wouldn't value a drop, one mm -hmm. drop. But in hell you would. Just like Luke 16, the rich man wanted a drop of water. You never get that drop. So you have that thirst feeling for all eternity. No sleep, the torment, the loud screams, the darkness, it's so intense. Now, I could only see through the flames and along the edges. It is so dark in hell, it consumes the light. You know, here, a pit a mile across would produce a lot of light, right? A whole mile is a big pit. Mm. Well, in hell it doesn't. It's so dark it consumes the light. So I could only see through it and just along the edges. And I was standing beneath a tunnel, and along the edges were these demonic creatures of all different sizes. Some were only two and three feet tall. Some were 12 and 13 feet tall. Everything twisted, deformed, grotesque, the most horrible looking creatures. Uh, there were snakes, and I was standing on a bed of maggots, solid maggots all over, crawling on people. But see, um, you know, Jesus said, where their worm dies not. And he used the word maggot. If you look it up it's in the original, it's the word maggot. And he said, where their worm dies not. See, in Isaiah 14, 11, says, where the maggot will be spread under thee and the worm will cover thee. It's the word maggot in the original. So that's why Jesus said, their worm dies not, because the flesh is never fully consumed. You see, I didn't know this, but if a dead animal is being eaten by maggots, I know this is disgusting, yeah. but if a dead animal here in life is being eaten by maggots, when the flesh is consumed, the maggots will die. I never knew that. Maggots die after the flesh is consumed. That's why Jesus said, where their worm dies not, because the flesh is never fully consumed in hell. Wow. So as Job 24, 20 says, the maggot will feed sweetly on thee. Is that disgusting enough? These things yeah. you're telling me, I'm, I'm, it's just, it's, I'm just sitting here going, wow. It, see, it's far worse than people ever imagine. And I never thought about hell. Never gave it a thought. I knew that it was fire. As a Christian, I knew, well, it's fire, it's hot. But never really gave it a thought. But, I mean, every horrible thing is experienced in hell. And you'll never get one good thing again. What was the fear like? The fear is so far beyond anything you can imagine. And I try to relate to people the fear, you know, all of us have gone through some kind of fear in life. Maybe you're in a car accident. You remember the moment before the impact? Maybe before you hit, the, the fear that jumped up in your throat. Maybe you're in a war and you saw some horrible things. Maybe you're robbed at gunpoint. That fear that you felt? Well, I'll share an experience I had. I used to surf a lot when I was a teenager. And uh, I was attacked by a 10-foot tiger shark. Grabbed my leg, pulled me down under the water. Now, you can imagine the fear that I felt at that moment, right? You can kind of relate to that. I can tell you in life, there's not much more fearful than that. <laughs> than having your leg in a shark's mouth. Well, that fear that I felt, David, paled in comparison to what you feel in hell. It wouldn't even register. So you have to endure that fear for all eternity. It's just suffering and it's pinnacle. Yeah. It's fear and it's pinnacle. It's, it's, it's all these, the wonderful things about God. And you, I like how you wor you've worded it before in your book and in the talks I've seen you give to where hell is simply not, not why well, I, I shouldn't say right. oversimplify, but it's the absence of everything right. that is good about God. Exactly. That, that's something the Lord revealed to me. See, James 1.17 says, every good and perfect gift comes down from above, from the Father of light. So all the good we enjoy in life comes from God. Fresh air, sunshine, sleep, fellowship, eating, drinking, all that comes from God. So God prepared hell for the devil. Matthew 25, 41, Jesus said hell was prepared for the devil and his angels. He never intended for man to go to this place, but he used the word prepared. Same word he used in John 14, 2, where he goes to prepare a place for us in heaven or make ready. Mm. So what he did was, since all good comes from him, he withdrew his goodness because he was preparing this for the devil. He threw the devil out of heaven. He prepared a place that had nothing to do with God. He withdrew his goodness. See, hell is dark because 1 John 1, 5 said God is light. There's only death in hell because John 1, 4 said God is life. There's only hatred in hell because 1 John 4, 16 said God is love. There's no mercy in hell because Psalms 36, 5 says the mercy of the Lord is in the heavens. There's no strength in hell because Psalms 18, 32 said it's the Lord that gives us strength. There's no water in hell because Deuteronomy 11, 11 says water is the rain of heaven. And there's no peace in hell because Isaiah 9, 6 says he is the prince of peace. 
Hmm. So you see, if God removes himself from the situation, all the good goes with him. You can't have the good without God. You can't separate the two. So if you're a person in life that says, you know, I don't want anything to do with God. Well, fine. Then there's a place prepared that has nothing to do with him. Wow. Other than one thing, the fire in hell does represent God's wrath. All through the Bible, it says he'll pour out his wrath in the form of fire on sin. But God poured out his wrath on Jesus on the cross so we wouldn't have to take that wrath. But if people deny Jesus as their Lord and Savior, then they have to take the wrath. But see, the other things experienced are because of his absence. So that's why hell is so horrible. So, so you, you were taken to this place, this prison-like place, and you were taken to a place where you saw people on fire. What else did you see? I, I saw demons tormenting people. Uh, like I said, demons all different sizes and shapes. Uh, people have no strength. They're burning. Uh, they're alone. They're just by themselves. They have no purpose, no destiny. It, it's just a complete waste in hell. And, and, but again, David, I really want to get this across to people. That worst part is that hopelessness. Because you understand there's no Calvary coming over the hill. There's no angels to come rescue you. There's no friend you're ever going to get to talk to. You understand. See, in life here, we always have hope. Even if your situation is so dire, you can always die to get out of your pain. But in hell, you understand you're not going to die. You're not going to get out of it. To go on for all eternity like this, it's beyond anything we can imagine. That's why this decision is so important for people to make, to receive Jesus, to repent of their sin, and receive Jesus as their Lord and Savior, so they can escape this horrible place. And that experience, how has that changed you, seeing all that? Well, it's given my wife and I a passion to want to go and share this with people. Now, David, I've never asked for one place to go. We've never even asked to write our book. The publisher came to us, and we've been invited all over the world to speak. We've never pursued anything. We've never promoted ourselves in any way, but God keeps opening up the doors. But I'm happy to go because I understand the value of a soul, and if I can point people to the Scripture, and by the Scriptures their eyes are opened, and they can avoid this horrible place, then they can avoid hell and go to heaven. So it's given me an eternal perspective. What's really important in life? God told us all as Christians to go and witness and share the gospel, right? That's what we're all supposed to do. Yeah. It's not just for pastors. So it's given us that desire and it's caused my wife and I to even leave our careers, which was not easy. We both made a lot of money in the real estate business. And I owned my own, my own company for 35 years and we walked away from that large income you know, that we to had. me that adds a lot of credibility to your story because a lot of times you see people who have these these stories and th there's nothing scriptural about their experiences right. they didn't leave anything behind they they're looking they're pushing themselves in their experience but with yours you you were a businessman in orange county right and you can't do well in orange county if you're telling people you went to hell right <laughs> right but you know for seven years, there was no book. The first seven years, I had, didn't have a book. And we were invited all around the country. We paid our own way, and we never took one penny from anybody everywhere we went around the country mm. for seven years. Then the publisher came to us, and they asked us to write the book. So it was not something we were looking to self-promote. But I was happy to write the book because I placed in there all the scriptures so people can read for themselves what the Bible says. They don't have to believe my experience. Just believe the Word of God. And again, that, when you say that, that again to me adds so much more credibility to what you're saying. It's, it's about pointing well, people to the truth of the Word of God, ultimately. Right. Well, we paid our own way. We didn't take any money. And then we walked away from our career. We were making a half a million dollars a year. That's not easy to walk away from, you know, and not knowing how we're going to survive. Mm. But God's taking care of us. Um, and he, he's a good God that we serve. So if I can, go back to this, this experience where you were there and then tell us now kind of the final moments leading up to you coming out of this experience. Well, when I was looking at all this horror, people being tormented, I was terrified in this dark tunnel and something began lifting me up, raising me up this tunnel. It was God, but I didn't realize that. Then I started ascending up this tunnel and then all of a sudden, this bright light appeared. Now, I knew immediately who it was. I had no question in my mind. I didn't see his face. I just saw the outline of a man standing in this bright, pure, holy light. It was like no light I've ever seen. And I just called out his name. I said, Jesus. And he said, I am. Hmm. And when he said, I am, I went out. I don't know if I died, passed out. I don't know what happened there. I can only explain that through Revelation 1.16. John, when he saw him, he said his countenance was bright as the sun, and I fell at his feet as one dead. Now, after time, he touched me, and I came to. And, you know, at first, when I came to, I was at his feet. And it hit me so strongly, David, that 
because he went to the cross, I didn't have to go to that horrible place. I was so grateful for the cross. I just was so thankful that the King of Kings, the maker of heaven and earth, died for me to keep me out of that horrible place. I just wanted to worship him. I didn't want to ask him any questions. I just want to thank him. But after a time, he, he started reading my thoughts and answering my thoughts. But Psalms 139.2 says he answers our thoughts afar off. And I thought, Lord, why did you send me to this horrible place? He said, because many people do not believe hell is real. He said, even some of my own people do not believe hell exists. Now that statement surprised me because I thought all Christians believe in hell. I found out since many Christians do not believe in a literal hell. There's some that believe in annihilationism, which is a teaching that says you simply cease to exist if you deny Jesus. And that's not true. Jesus said in Matthew 25, 46, these shall go into everlasting life and these shall go into everlasting punishment. He used the word everlasting as the word ionios. Just as heaven is everlasting, so is hell everlasting. It says the same thing in John 5, 29, Mark 16, 16, Daniel 12, 2, Acts 24, 15, Revelation 14, 10, 11. Many verses that talk about hell is eternal. It's for real. It will last for all eternity. And uh, I was just so thankful. Other people believe in universalism. That's a teaching that says that everybody gets saved. That's mm. not true. Or soul sleep. Many false teachings out there. And I thought, Lord, why did those demons hate me so much? Why did they hate me so much? He said, because you're made in my image and they hate me. Remember, Jesus said in John 15, 18, they hated me before they hated you. Those demons have a hatred for God and a hatred for his creation. And uh, then I thought, Lord, I don't want to tell anybody about this experience. They're going to think I'm crazy or had a bad dream. He said, it's not your job to convict their hearts. It's the Holy Spirit's. He said, you just go and tell them. I said, yes, sir, I'll go. But you don't have to admit, I complained for the first seven years when there was no book, I complained about this. I had a real estate business making a lot of money. I didn't need the ridicule. Why do I need to do this? And I kind of griped to the Lord. But he said to me, you know, Bill, it's not about you being comfortable. It's about you being obedient. Wow. You know, and God's given us all a job to do. And nobody is more important than anybody else. We all have a job to do in the body of Christ. It doesn't matter what he's called you to do. Just be obedient and do it with all your heart. It reminds me of Isaiah chapter 6. Where he, where he was speaking about go to the people, tell them that we're not listening. And, it was, and, and often when I look at that scripture with Isaiah, is God, God sent him, it's almost like people telling me as an evangelist, you're going to go and preach the gospel and no one will ever get saved. You know, yeah. that's pretty much what he told Isaiah. But it's so key what you said about delivering that message that's in your heart that it doesn't matter if, if I mean, results leave to him. Right. But I'm just going to be obedient. Exactly. That's all we're called to do is be obedient. You know, and at first, the first year, I wanted to grab everybody by the shirt collar and, and make sure they get saved, you know? <laughs> and, uh, you know, because you understand, you, I've been there, I saw it. And people say, you know, I don't believe that. I just don't believe the Bible. And you get frustrated, you know? But the Lord showed me, you know, you're not the Savior. You're just the messenger boy. Just give them the message, let them make a decision. So that's why now my wife and I, we just are here to share information so people can make an informed decision. Tell them about the Bible, show them the scripture, explain salvation to them so they can make that decision themselves. But people have to understand, they have to decide. God's not sending anybody to hell. People think God's the one sending people to hell, that he's some mean God. But they understand, it's the same God that came and died a horrible death on the cross to keep us out. Hmm. So how mean is that? Well, I yeah. was going to ask you, and, and I'm going to, hopefully, if you don't mind, I'm going to transition now to some just some of the things that, I mean, I heard your experience and there, immediately there are some thoughts and I know you've probably heard them all before. But you talked about annihilation and I don't believe that and I don't believe in universalism. That, that to me, that's heresy. It's dangerous. Right. I tell people, I'd rather offend people into heaven than comfort them into hell. Good point. And, and you know, so when I preach the gospel, it's with that urgency of this eternal place. But annihilation, some would say, that's just, that seems so much more just because someone who sins, they sin, as you've said, maybe 70, 80, 100 years in very few cases. They, they have a life of sin for 100 years. And then, like you said, they get punished for all of eternity, that hopelessness of every moment that goes by. Right. Not a single, I've not come a single moment closer to getting out of here. Is that just, that God would punish someone for eternity for temporary sin? It is, and two reasons. Number one, time is the wrong premise. We think of paying off your time in hell. Well, time is the wrong premise because that would be works. You'd stand before God and say, look, I paid off my sins. And we can't pay off our sins. We're saved by grace, not by works. 
So that's number one, it would offend the Word of God. It would be contrary to the Word of God. And besides, you can never pay for your own sin. Only the shed blood of Jesus can pay for sin. But here's the real reason why it's, it's just. You see, in Thomas Aquinas, he was the greatest theologian of the medieval church. And he said in his book, Summa Theologia, he explained this. This is really a good point. He explained that the higher the position the one sinned against, the graver the sin. In other words, if I lie to you, it would be wrong. But if I lie to the Supreme Court, it would be worse because of their position. If I punch my brother in the stomach, it would be wrong. But if I punch my mother in the stomach, that would be worse because of her position. Right? She's in a higher position. Well, God is infinitely greater in position. Therefore, the punishment is deserved of eternal punishment. But not only is he greater in position, he's greater in being. You know, if I step on a bug and kill it, it's no big deal, even though that's life. But if I kill a dog or a cat, that would be worse, wouldn't it? That's deserving of some kind of punishment. But if I kill a human being, that would be far worse, wouldn't it? Absolutely. And that's deserving of a much greater punishment. Well, we're sinning against a holy, eternal, perfect God. So he is infinitely greater in being also. So therefore, it's deserving of an eternal punishment because we sinned against an eternal, perfect God. That is such a good point. That is such an excellent point. And um, I mean, and it, and it does away with that because it, like you said, people think of paying off their time and how they go, they, right. they chip rocks with sledgehammer or whatever. That's what people, most people envision. But I, I, I think that it's so important to know who we're offending, right. who we're sinning against. And, and God will not offend His Word also. Once he, His Word is forever settled in heaven, Psalms 119.89 and Psalms 89.34. He can't change or alter the thing that's gone out of His mouth. And He said in Hebrews 9.22, uh, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. So we're saved by His blood, not by time. He can't offend or go against His Word. That's another reason. So why is it that God, once someone dies, why is that it? Why is that final? Why can't someone get saved in hell? Well, because we have to make that decision now while we have that opportunity. See, hell, we'd be being saved by sight. You're saved by faith. All through the Bible, it says that we're saved by faith. And uh, Galatians 3, uh, 6, Galatians 3, 24, uh, Acts 3, 16, many scriptures talk about we're saved by faith alone. Well, in hell, you wouldn't need any faith. You, you see it. So there's no faith required. And God accounts our faith as righteousness. See, normally we would have to be perfect to get in heaven. That was, and none of us are perfect. So God considered our trust or faith in what Jesus did as, as if we were righteous. So our faith is considered as righteousness, not time in hell. It's our faith. So someone getting saved in hell, well, sure, they see it. It's easy now to believe, hey, the Bible's right, God's right, there's a real hell. There would be no faith required. We're going to take some questions now from atheists and skeptics for our brother Bill Weiss here. And brother Bill, um, you just feel free to take as much time as you want to answer them. And uh, here's the first uh, question we have here, and it's called the double bind. Take a look at this. You claim that God sent you down there in order to prove the terribleness of hell. Taking a quote from a past interview, you said that he wanted people to know. God is omniscient and omnipotent. He could have easily shown everyone this experience, and then the message would have been given to the entire population. If the end goal of this experience was to spread the truth, then why did he not do that? You may answer with God loves us. In order for our love to be true, we must have faith in him. He does not directly prove himself to everyone, and we have free will so that our love is true. Is it not a violation of this for him to prove himself to you? Faith is made obsolete, and in essence, your love becomes manufactured. So why would God do this? It is in stark contrast with the very reason God made us, and it accomplishes nothing. In order for your story to have any believability, you must break this double bind. First of all, God is not proving anything to me. I was already a Christian. That's the difference. He's thinking I was unsaved, so God had to prove that there's a hell for me, and why should he do that? I think that's what he's thinking. Yeah. But I was already a Christian, and this is a vision, and God is fulfilling Scripture. Because in Acts 2.17, he says, In the last days, your old men will dream dreams, your young men will be, have visions. So God is fulfilling his word by allowing people to have dreams and visions. This was an uh, out-of-body experience that would be classified as a vision in the Bible. And there's 34 different visions in the Bible and 35 different dreams. So dreams and visions are all through the Bible, so God is fulfilling His Word. He's not trying to prove His Word, He's fulfilling it. 
Okay, so that's number one. Number two, God is not going to get show hell to everybody because he could do that easily and split the sky and appear. But again, people need to be saved by faith. And he gives enough evidence of himself that he's real through creation. In Romans 1, he said his evidence, the evidence of God is obvious through design. There must be a designer. So he reveals himself through creation. And uh, he's not going to show anybody hell in, in a sense of a person that's not saved for them to get saved. Mm -hmm. Now, there are some people that he has given a dream or a vision about hell that are not saved. But it's usually people that are seeking him. They're wanting an answer. Because Job 33 says, uh, he even gives man dreams and visions to keep back his soul from the pit. So he will give a man a dream or a vision if that person is seeking him, wants to know the truth, like the guy in the jungle that never heard the gospel. And he looks up to the heavens and says, there must be a God. Look at all this design everywhere. Lord, who are you? I want to know you. God will find a way. He'll get a Bible to that man, or he'll get uh, a missionary to him, or he'll see it on TV or radio, or he'll give him a dream or a vision. Or it's a person that maybe a parent is praying for them. Their kid is rebellious and the parent is praying diligently for them to get saved. God may give them a vision or a dream about hell. But in general, he's not going to give all of population uh, the, a vision of hell because we're all saved by faith. And it doesn't violate that with you because you are already a believer. Exactly. I was already a believer. I think that's an excellent answer. So that's clear. I, I find most atheists are just bad theologians. Well, he just probably didn't realize that I was also already a believer. Yeah, yeah. I think so. That guy, a so it's a good kid, question. Yeah. Okay, so here's a question now on perception. In your experience, you stated that you saw large reptiles, jail cells, and fire. These are all very human and common when one thinks about punishment and evil. Using scripture, how do you show that it is more likely that this was real, not just a hallucination? Please provide a full... Please provide the full passages and explain why this shows that it must be true. And because everything is perception, how real it felt does not hold any relevance. Well, I listed 250 verses in my second book called Hell, Separate the Truth from Fiction. So I've got all the scriptures documented in the book. But just to give a sample, uh, prison cells, Isaiah 24, 22. Proverbs 7, 27, Job 17, 16, Jonah 2, 6. That's just a few about prison cells. Uh, there's many scriptures on uh, fire, Psalms 11, 6, Psalms 140, verse 10, Matthew 13, 49, Isaiah 33, 12 through 14. I could go and quote them all, but for time's sake, I'm just going to give the address. And so everything I saw is already in the Bible. Demons being torment, tormenting people or torment. I'll just maybe I'll just rattle off a few of those so they can be happy. Uh, Matthew 18 34 mentions being delivered to the tormentors. Luke 12 47 says you'll be beaten with many stripes or beaten with few. Who's doing the beating? Psalms 50 verse 22 You that forget God, you will be torn to pieces. Matthew 24 51 I will cut him in pieces where there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Psalms 116.3, the pains of Sheol have gotten hold upon me. I found trouble and sorrow. Amos 5.18 and 19, for what good is the day of the Lord to you? Judgment day. It'll be darkness, and as a man fled from a lion, and a bear met him. Job 33.22, his soul draws near to Sheol and his life to the destroyers. Psalms 141.7, their bones are scattered at Sheol's mouth. Psalms 49.14, their beauty shall consume away from their dwelling. Psalms 32.10, many sorrows shall be to the wicked. Psalm 78.49, I will cast my wrath upon them by sending evil angels among them. Just give two more. Uh, Deuteronomy 32.22 says, For a fire is kindled in mine anger and shall burn unto the lowest hell. They shall be burnt with hunger and devoured with burning heat and bitter destruction. I will also send the teeth of beasts upon them with poison of serpents of the dust. And Psalm 7420, one more, Psalm 7420, for the dark places of the earth are full of the habitations of cruelty. And the word cruelty there in the original, look it up in the Strong's, it's the word Hamas. We've all heard that word before, right? Hamas? They say it's the most violent word in the Hebrew language. Well, that's what you're experiencing in hell. I think he answered the question, would you say? Yeah. <laughs> that was that was excellent. So I think you answered. That's what he wanted um, from Scripture. Okay. So here's another one uh, pertaining to strength. Being that strength is an attribute of God and hell contains none of God's attributes, how could the demons have strength? You have previously stated that you lost strength, so why didn't the demons? They cannot be separate from this rule because God's essence is completely absent in hell. 
So how can this be coherent? Because demons are separate. The whole Bible deals with man. It's to do with man, not to do with demons. Now, there's comments about demons and for us to understand and know that they exist. But the Bible is concentrated on man. So God deals with demons separately. And uh, demons have great strength. We know because Mark 5, 4, the demoniac running through the tombs, it said he broke chains. So we know he was possessed with a legion of demons. So we know he had great strength from demons. Uh, angels have great strength. Psalms 103.20 and 2 Peter 2.11 says angels have great strength. Well, demons are fallen angels. So they still have their strength because they're not dealt with yet because they're dealt with in Revelation 20.10 uh, where it says Satan and his demons are cast into the lake of fire at judgment day. Mm -hmm. But until then, they are on the earth, Revelation 12.4, and they're in hell. And uh, Isaiah 12 through 14 says, Lucifer was cast down to Sheol, that's the current hell, Sheol, to the sides of the pit. So there's demons in hell, demons on the earth, and God hasn't dealt with them yet. They'll be dealt with later at uh, Judgment Day. So right now, remember Jesus was casting out a demon in Matthew 8, 29. And the demon said to him, have you come to torment us before the time? What time was he talking about? The time we talking about was Revelation 2010. At Judgment Day, they'll be dealt with and cast in the lake of fire. But until then, they have rain on the earth, they can torment people, and they still have their strength. I think that's a perfect segue into this next question because you talk about demons being in hell. Now, we didn't, we didn't get to touch much on it. You, you talked about being under the earth. Right. You, 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 you have shown through Scripture that hell is located in the center of the earth. Is that, right. is that that's a, yes. what you said? Okay, so someone has a question on hell's location. This is question number four about hell's location. How do you justify that hell is physically in earth when it is mathematically proven that the earth is not hollowed out? Also, in scientists' study of the Earth's composition, they would have noticed that by now. If you are going to justify with Scripture, then how is it more likely that hell is literally there rather than descent? And the terms used in the Bible were just figurative language or used in relation to the placement of a tomb. Well, first of all, I justify it because Scripture does. There's 49 Scriptures that talk about where the current hell is. Almost every commentary and every great leader of the past and present all believe that hell is currently in the center of the earth. That goes across the board for almost everybody. But the Scripture is so clear. I'll just give a couple. Ezekiel 26.20 says, uh, when, when I shall descend into the lower parts of the earth in places desolate of old with them that go down into the pit. And the word pit there is the word Sheol. So it's talking about descending down into the earth. And in um, uh, number 1632 mentions that the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up uh, uh, the, all these men. And it said the earth opened her mouth and they uh, were swallowed up and went down alive into Sheol. So they went down in the earth, down to Sheol. Jesus descended into the lower parts of the earth. In uh, Matthew 12, 40, it says that he spent three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And in 1 Samuel 28, 14, when Samuel was coming up by the witch of Endor, uh, had him come up, it said he ascended up out of the earth. He was coming out of Abraham's bosom, which hell was separated by a golf fix then. You know, it was paradise was on the one side and a, uh, the suffering of hell was on the other side. And it said it was separated by a gulf fixed in Luke 16. Remember the Luke 16, that Abraham said that you're separated by a gulf fixed. And the word gulf is the word uh, gorge. It says a deep gorge in the earth separated the two. So it's an actual geographical location. Because it was separated from a gulf, he could see a cross. He said, I look across and could see Abraham in his bosom. So it is actually down deep in the earth. And there's so many verses that make it clear that that's where it's currently at. And then death and hell deliver up the dead that are in them in Revelation 20, 13 at Judgment Day. But right now, people are down deep in the earth. The scripture's really clear on that if you read all 49 of them. Absolutely. But, but the, also, the point I, point I want to make is that uh, hell, the, the reason uh, he's thinking that... Um, Scientists say that, you know, the earth is, he said the earth is solid in the center. It's not hollowed out. Right. Well, first of all, scientists are not positive about anything about the earth. They, they assume that that's what it's like because they can only dig down nine miles deep and it's 4,000 miles down. So there's no way they can know absolutely what's down in the earth. They can assume what's there by, by the gases that come up and they, they 
uh, guess and estimate what it is. And they say the very center is solid, but then they say around the center is uh, a liquid. So it could be in the liquid area. It doesn't mean it's right in the center. It could be down in the liquid area. And they don't even know that it's solid for certain. They can't say that with certainty because no one can dig down into the earth. I love it. I love it. I love it. Okay, so uh, now I'm wondering if anybody here has any questions for Brother Bill, um, and then you go ahead and ask the question, then I'll repeat it just so we have it on mic. Feel perfectly comfortable. Like I said, I want you guys to feel, feel comfortable with asking. Anybody here have any questions for Brother Bill here? Right here. When you were, when you were down in hell, did you feel like your, your flesh was deteriorating? Okay, so he's asking, when you were down in hell, did you feel like your flesh was deteriorating? No, I didn't, but I was not there I was there in a vision, so I was there a little differently than an unsaved person would be. So I, I'm sure my experience was a little different than them. I saw people's flesh hanging off their bones oh. in that pit of fire, so I did see their flesh hanging. Most of the people were skeleton form, like almost no flesh on their bo bones. I didn't experience that. God spared me from being burned. I felt the heat, I saw the people burning, but I didn't have to experience that. So that's a good question. And, there, and I saw you with your hand raised. The first time you told that it was um, your wife, was it tough for her to believe you? Was it hard for your wife to believe you when, when she first heard? No. She knows me and she believed me totally, but uh, she found me screaming on the floor. When I came back in my body, I, I entered back in my body, and, and hell is so severe that I felt my body literally dying. And I was at the best shape of my life then. I worked out like a lot and I was in really good physical shape, but I felt my body dying because hell is so severe. You know, you've heard of people that have died of fright. Well, you can literally die of fright. And I started screaming and I went into a traumatized state. Well, my screams woke up my wife and she found me on the floor and I screamed out, pray for me, pray for me, the Lord has taken me to hell. And so she actually felt a peace about her because she knew that God was in control. And she believed me totally, and then I stayed up the rest of the night explaining to her what happened. And then I asked God to confirm it the next day, you know, because the next day, even though I know I was there, you still ask for confirmation. And I was heading back over to Pastor Rollins Sharon's house, and uh, he was going to sign some papers for a refinance that he was doing, I believe. And when I got there, I said, Lord, I know I was there, but can you just give me a glimpse of it one more time? because it's daylight now and you know it's just so surreal. You asked for that? I asked for oh that. I know that's goodness. crazy. <laughs> but but I asked for just a glimpse, okay? okay? Just a glimpse. <laughs> oh my god. Anyway, I suddenly left my car when I pulled up in front of Pastor Rawls' house. I left my car and I found myself traveling down this long tunnel back into hell. And I was there this time as only as an observer, not as a participant. But I saw these people burning in this pit of fire. And then I was pulled back up this tunnel and came back in my car. And I was only there about 10 seconds. And I was so shook up, I couldn't move for about 20 minutes. I just sat frozen in the car, soaked. And Pastor Raul was busy on the phone, fortunately. So he was motioning for me to come in. I don't know if he even remembers this. And uh, he was motioning for me to come in, but he was tied up on the phone. So I couldn't even move. And when I got out of the car, I came in and he, he said, Bill, what's wrong with you? I didn't even tell him. And even though he's a close friend, I didn't even want to tell him, but he sensed something was wrong. And I just said, Lord, I don't want to ever see that place again. I saw it enough, and that, that's enough. So, do, you, do you ever doubt your experience? No, never. God has confirmed it a thousand times over ever since then. And besides, I already know. I mean, it's, you'll ne you can't see hell and, and be the same. It changes your whole life. And, you know, I wouldn't leave my career and, and a good income for no reason. And I wouldn't, why do I need the ridicule? What would I need that for? Yeah. You know, so no, I know absolutely I saw it. And, but again, it's not important. I don't try to convince anyone to believe me. I continually try to point them to the scriptures. Check out the scripture and avoid this place. They don't have to believe me. I love, I believe it, but I love that approach. And you know, the dreams in the Bible, all the dreams and visions, they never try to defend their dream. If you read every one of them, they just reported it. No one had to defend it. Hmm. Well, that's why I felt like the Lord said, you just report it. You don't have to defend it. But I defend it through Scripture. And again, it's, it's, it's not to defend my experience, but defend what the Bible says. The reality of hell. Because there's so many churches not teaching the truth about hell. A lot of churches don't even teach about hell. And a lot of Christians don't believe in hell. Or it's downplayed. 
and it's softened and it's not really that bad. It's maybe only separation from God, which is horrible, but they don't realize that. But they don't believe it's real literal fire and, or all the other things experienced. Many people don't believe that. And, and see, if you don't realize how severe it is, you won't be as appreciative of your own salvation. And that's one of the reasons as Christians we need to know how severe it is and understand it so we will appreciate what he saved us from, number one. Number two, it'll cause us all to walk more in the fear of the Lord. You know, many Christians say they live compromised lifestyles. They live in sin. They sleep with their boyfriend or girlfriend. They cheat on their taxes. They, don't, uh, and they do all kinds of things thinking, oh, you know, I'm under grace, I'm okay. There's a lack of a fear of a God. Now, even though we are to cry out, Abba, Father, Daddy, Father, we are first to have a reverential fear of Almighty God because He's a God that hates sin. But the fear of the Lord in Deuteronomy 7, or 6 and Deuteronomy 17 says, the fear of the Lord is to read His Word and obey His Word. That's what the fear of the Lord is, is to obey Him because we have enough respect for Him that we don't want to offend Him in sin. And Jesus said in Mark 9, 47, if your eye offends thee, and the word offend means causes you to sin, he said, pluck it out. It's better for you to enter into life maimed than into hell fire. So he's telling us if you're living a lifestyle of sin, you're in danger of hell fire. And Proverbs 16, 6 says, by the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil. So it's the fear that keeps us walking the straight walk, not just the love of God. There's many people that say, oh, I love God, but they don't fear him. That's the difference. So it'll instill that fear in us, a holy reverential fear. And then number three, it'll give us all more of a passion for the lost. You know, many of us go to church, we hear a nice message, and we go home. We don't really bother to witness. And yet that's what we're called to do is share the gospel. Now, yeah, it might be a little uncomfortable because, you know, we don't, we don't want to offend people. But yet we're supposed to fear God, not man. And share the truth because we share we have the words of life in us that can change someone's eternity if we open up our mouths and actually God holds us accountable if we don't it says in Ezekiel 33 8 if we fail to speak to warn the sinner from his way his blood will I require at your hand that's a strong verse it says the same thing in Acts 20 26 and Acts 18 6 Colossians 1 28 says Christ in you the hope of glory whom we preach warning every man so we are to warn every man. That's why Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5, 10, 11, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Now the terror of the Lord he was talking about, the commentary say he was talking about judgment and hell in general. When you understand that, you'll be more persuasive with men. Mm. You'll want to. Can you see that? Yeah, there, is, there are people watching right now that have family members, friends, relatives, uh, co-workers who are going to hell. Right. And they're complacent. What exactly. would you say to that person? You know, if you have relatives that are going to hell and you're a Christian, you can pray for them. And I urge you to please do so because one second after they die, it'll be too late. They will not have another chance and they'll spend an eternity in this horrible place. And we as Christians can pray. Sometimes it takes fasting. Fasting makes a big difference. If you pray and fast for your loved ones, then God will see to it that they get saved if you're diligent with your prayers. And if you're a person out there that doesn't know the Lord, I urge you to think about this. All you have to do is repent of your sin. That means say you're sorry. And say, God, I'm sorry, I'm a sinner, I can't save myself. But I believe you sent your son Jesus to die on a cross for me, that he shed his blood for me. You have to repent of your sin and acknowledge Jesus is the Son of God and invite him into your heart. That is the only way of salvation. Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. Now, we all want to live at his house. We do it his way. And, you know, Revelation 20, 15 says, Whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. God has a book. And he's going to look to see if your name is in his book on Judgment Day. You can know that right now if you say this prayer. Can we have him say a prayer? Absolutely. Absolutely. If you would say this prayer, you can know that your name would be written in his book. Just say, Dear Heavenly Father, I ask you to forgive me of my sins. I repent. I'm sorry for my sin. I ask you to come into my heart. I receive you as my Lord and Savior. You are the Son of God, and it's by your shed blood that I have forgiveness of my sins. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross for me. Thank you, Jesus for taking me to heaven. I repent of my sin and I acknowledge that you are the Son of God and I now confess 
that I am a born-again Christian going to heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Praise God. You know, it's so simple to be saved, but yet people fight it. And people think God's sending people to hell. He's not sending anyone to hell. They have to understand that all of us above the age of accountability are automatically going to hell. John 3, 17 and 18 says we're condemned already because of our sin. That's different than being sent there. We're already going there. That's why Jesus came, was to plant a cross right in the middle of that road. So all we have to do is look up to the cross, be humble enough to admit I'm a sinner, and he'll pull us off that road and take us to heaven. But because he loves man, he gives him that free will to choose. We have a free will. That's proof that he loves man. But he gives, he gives him that choice. You know, cause, but Revelation 21 8 says, all unbelievers shall have their part in the lake of fire. So if people say, you know, Bill, I don't believe you, I don't believe the Bible. Well, he just told you where you'll end up. That's why Jesus said in Matthew 12, 37, your own words will condemn you. Because you said with your mouth, I don't believe the Bible. So you send yourself to hell. He's not sending anyone. People send themselves by rejection of the truth. Wow, that is such God. a good word. That is such a good word, and it's so needed. Not many are preaching the truth. It's a no. secular, seeker-sensitive culture. Right. And this message is so important. Today. And so I want to thank you for sharing it. I want to th thank our brother here for coming here today. And, and you know, it's just, thank you so much. It, it, it's, it's been an honor to have you on. And uh, was it? I was, I was going to, I don't know, do we have one more minute to share Absolutely. one thing? We have as many minutes as you want to take. Well, I just want to share this one thing because people don't understand too. They think that, you know, uh, see, people really feel that good has so much to do with it. They really can't imagine. They think, God's a loving God. How can he let a good person go to hell? That, that's the common misconception. I just really want to address that quickly because that stands out in people's mind. They really struggle with a good God allowing a person to go to hell. But good has nothing to do with it for two reasons. And if they can understand this, people might be pretty good compared to their standard. But if they're going to go by good, they have to compare to God's standard. His standard is perfect. Heaven and God are perfect. And he said in Revelation 21, 27, that he'll let nothing in heaven that defiles or corrupts. See, so he cannot let us in heaven the way we are. We would mess it up just like we have the earth, right? So he cannot, his standard is so high that he said in James 2.10, if we offend his law in even one point, we're guilty of all. If we lie once, if we steal one thing, if we have one lustful thought. There's even a scripture in Proverbs 24.9 that says, even the thought of foolishness is a sin. If we have one foolish thought, that would exclude us from heaven. That's a pretty high standard, isn't it? So we can't stand before a holy God and say, I'm pretty good, let me in. Good has nothing to do with it because you're not good enough compared to his standard. And thank God it's not based on being good, it's based on a relationship with Jesus Christ. But the second reason good has nothing to do with it is that an analogy would help. If you, know, if you went and found the most expensive home in the country and you knocked on their door and you said, uh, excuse me, but I'm moving in with you because I'm a good person, what do you think the people would say? No, right? You don't know them. You have no relationship with them. You wouldn't expect them to let you move in. Well, the same way, people go through their whole life. They have nothing to do with God. They deny Jesus is the Son of God, which he said is the only way to his house. Then at the end of their life, they have the nerve to come knock on his door and say, I'm pretty good, let me in. Hmm. What does good have to do with it? You don't know him. You have no relationship with him. You see, God offers to be their father throughout their whole life, but they push him away. They say, I don't want you. See, God is their creator, but he's not their father until they invite in Jesus as their savior. Then he becomes their father. So until then, they have no right to live at his house. That's unreasonable to expect to live at someone's house that you don't know. See, he's not your father. Galatians 3.26, John 1.12, John 8.44, Romans 9, 7, and 8, all explain that he's your creator. He's not your father. So they have to invite him in. Doesn't that, that make sense? That is one of the best analogies I have ever heard when it comes to God's mercy, knowing him and, and, and eternity. It's, and it is so true. It's relationship. Right. Depart from me, for I never knew you. Right. And he cannot let us into heaven the way we are again because our nature is different than his. See, if I stuck my hand into the fire to retrieve something and it burned me, I wouldn't say, why'd that fire burn me? That was mean in that fire. I wouldn't say that, would I? Why? No. Because the nature of the fire is to burn. I would expect it to burn my hand. My hand and fire are not compatible. Well, neither is a holy God and sinful man because it says his nature is fire. Hebrews 12, 29 and Nahum 1, 5 said, he's a consuming fire and everyone would be consumed at his presence. So his nature is not like ours. We can't show up in his presence the way we are. We would be consumed. So he cannot overlook our sin. He has to give us a new nature. 
And that only comes through a relationship. He gives us a new heart and a new spirit when we get born again. See, so if we understand these things, that we can't just show up at heaven and, and stroll in the door. You know, we're not good enough. We have to have a different nature. And God loves people and gives them that free will to choose. You believe his word or don't you? It's up to people. And God leaves the choice to us. That's right. Well, thank you again for coming on. I, I, I appreciate you being here. Brother Bill, it's a privilege to have you on. It's a blessing thank you. to have you here. And thank you for watching. We will see you next time on Encounter TV. God bless you.